That's great. Thank you very much indeed, David. Regina Diana, seductress, singer, spy. And it's certainly very exciting for me to be opening the WFA's 2023 webinars. And it's particularly appropriate because today is the 105th anniversary, plus two days, of the death of a woman who frustrated, intrigued, and ultimately almost drove not only me, but also my Swiss nephew, Lieutenant Colonel David Semeraro, to distraction. Hidden from history for close on a century, her story and what it took to uncover this story tested our mutual powers of perseverance to the full. So, in the words of the song, let us go back to the very beginning, the very best place to start, and I hope you will bear with me as I briefly tell you about the earliest days of David and my search for the elusive Regina Diana, singer, seductress, and spy, and the many months during which we faced obfuscation, denials, incorrect documents, and numerous metaphorical and even physical Gallic shrugs. In the spring of 2013, I was slightly idly turning the pages of a series of volumes that I'm sure that many of, you, many of you who are Western Front members are familiar with. The War Illustrated, a pictorial record of the conflict of the nations with 2,750 illustrations. I must admit that I have never actually checked the veracity of the number of photographs. Maybe if there had been only 2,749, I would not be with you this evening. Because when I turned those pages, I could never have guessed that that simple act of flicking through the dusty volume was going to change both my and my nephew's life profoundly. Page 227 of volume seven, which covered August to December 1917, had fallen open. And the caption on one of the grainy images under the typical war illustrated headline, which was Agents of Prussia's Worldwide Espionage, informed readers that it, a quote, and I quote, Regina Diane, a Swiss singer, was condemned to death in France on being found guilty as a German spy. My husband calls this the page that launched a thousand hours of frustration. I was immediately intrigued on several counts. First of all, even in 2013, I prided myself on knowing quite a bit about women in World War I, and I had never heard of Regina Diane. Secondly, I had been brought up and educated in French-speaking Switzerland and the Swiss take the teaching of Swiss history seriously. We had done Switzerland's role, role in World War I in detail. To my recollection, it took about 45 minutes. We were taught Switzerland was neutral and nothing happened there between 1914 and 1918. Little did I know back then that we were being taught, shall I say, an alternative truth, but I'll come back to that one in a minute. Let's just say, that in 2013, I thought it was odd that I had not heard of Regina Diane. I wanted to include a section of spies in the book I was then writing, and as the title of the book was, The Forgotten Women of World War I, this Regina Diane might fit the bill nicely. She sounded as though she had indeed been forgotten. I did what we all do, a quick Google search, and this revealed precisely nothing. I decided to phone my sister who lives in Lausanne in Switzerland. I knew that one of her friends was a journalist. Perhaps he would be able to direct me towards an archive of Swiss newspapers and maybe he could even have a quick glance for me. I awaited her reply impatiently. She got back to me. She had drawn a complete blank with the journalist. Rather in passing, and no doubt rolling her eyes slightly, which means Viv's at it again, she mentioned my query to her son, David. He says, it was as though a bolt of lightning had gone through him. There and then, 
he made up his mind that we were going to find Regina, although he confesses he had little idea of what might, this might in fact involve. As an officer in the Swiss army, certain doors are open to David that are closed to ordinary Swiss mortals, even more so to foreign ones such as myself. He was fairly confident that by pulling rank, he could get access to the Archive de la Confédération Helvétique. They helpfully took attention and agreed to check files. But in the first of what would turn out to be countless disappointments, they soon replied that they were unable to confirm whether this Regina Diane was Swiss. No record mentioned her, let alone provided any information relating to where she came from and where she had lived. One could have expected that if a Swiss national had been shot by France, there would be some trace of her, but no, she was nowhere to be found. Our next idea was to email the city of Marseille archives. Eventually, they replied. They had no information. They suggested contacting the Service Historique de la Défense in Paris, who only respond slowly, very slowly, to written as opposed to email requests for information. Some six or seven months into the quest, we had got precisely nowhere. Then I received a letter from a Colonel Boulanger, a spy with the alias Regina Diana had operated in Marseille. They informed me that her real name was Marie-Antoinette Avico, and rather than being a Swiss national, she had simply been resident in Geneva all her life. We could, this colonel helpfully informed us, consult the documents at the French military archives at the Chateau de Vincennes in Paris. And even more helpfully, he sent me the reference numbers. David and I arranged to meet in Vincennes in February 2014 and consult the documents. Issued with the necessary reader's passes, excitedly, we opened the boxes we had pre-ordered. After nearly a year of searching for her, Regina was within our grasp. Hundreds of dusty documents tumbled out of the big brown boxes. But catastrophe, something had gone very wrong. Someone, and to this day, David being a bit of a conspiracy theorist, is convinced that this was intentional. Someone had given us the incorrect document references. Being a military archive, Vincennes is run, run along strict hierarchical lines. First, we were directed towards a lowly corporal to whom we explained we had been given the wrong files. He eventually, after many Gallic shrugs, escalated our request to be given access to the correct documents up his chain of command. Eventually, we were summoned into an inner sanctum and pleaded with the capitaine in charge of the salle de lecture to help us get the documents we needed. He curtly informed us that the Avico papers were unavailable. They were on someone's desk waiting to be digitized for the Memoir des Hommes website, which was going live in November 2014, the very month that my book about the women of the First World War was being published. I began remonstrating, surely this little rule could be bent for 24 hours which would be hopefully long enough to get the gist of the story and copy the documents. His law was emphatic. The French army does not bend rules and certainly not for representatives of perfidious Albion. David, being a dual national, had misguidedly registered with the re reading room using his British passport. Point final. In the ensuing nine months, I rather forgot about Regina, but David did not. She seemed to be continually nagging him, and if the truth be told, he was nagging me. Then, in tw November 2014, the Memorial des Hommes website did go live. We clicked around, hoping to find something about Marie Antoinette. Then, as we opened the files, David in Switzerland and I in Chelmsford in Essex, 
Little did we realize what secrets this file contained, nor could either of us ever have anticipated the long physical and metaphorical journey we were about to embark on. One that neither of us or our soon to be long suffering families anticipated when I flicked through the 2,750 illustrations of the war illustrated and made that phone call in 2013. So who exactly was this woman who by November 2014 had preoccupied us for something like 18 months? In fact, very little is known of Marie-Antoinette Abico's early years, other than she was born in Geneva in July 1885 to an Italian cobbler father and a French laundress mother. This, in keeping with the customs of the time, meant that she had Italian nationality. She attended the primary school for girls in the working class area of Petit Sacconé in Geneva. Now, rather ironically, home to Geneva Airport and the swanky exhibition centres. But in those days, it was a very working class area. Marie Antoinette briefly, tantalisingly, danced to view at the age of 15, when, for some unexplained reasons, she participated in ransacking a local grocery shop where, according to police records, she was involved in causing some damage to private property as well as petty theft. She was hastily dispatched to her mother's family in Collange, just across, just across the border from Switzerland and in France, apprenticed to a milliner. She came to loathe France and she failed to settle down. She returned fairly soon to Geneva and fell in with a questionable local gang headed by a young garage manager by the name of Cherix. Like Marie Antoinette, he also loathed France. In the 1910s, Cherix became one of Geneva's most renowned and canny mobsters. His underworld network contacts and businesses show he had a finger in every pie, some of them legitimate, some on the shady side of the law. The pies spread from cabarets, exotic dancers, alcohol, to smuggling food, cigarettes, toys, and clothes. But the jewel in his crown was rubber, whose price was soaring sky high, providing easy money for anyone who knew how to exploit the industrialized, as well as the military world's insatiable appetite for this commodity essential to the dawning of the brave new 20th century. Cherix was crafty and ruthless. Geneva, the border city, the hub between Southeastern and Western Europe became an overnight marketplace for goods from across the continent. There was easy money to be made for those willing to function, if not on the blind, at least on the shady side of the law. Marie Antoinette was definitely keen to help. And she was soon helping Cherique smuggle tires and mechanical parts across the Swiss border. With the cost of living and of goods being substantially lower in France than in Switzerland, even in those days, many customers and indeed customs officers chose to ignore where commodities came from. By now, voluptuous Marie Antoinette's frequent pre-war forays across the border made her a familiar figure when, in late 1914, she began crossing into and out of France for more nefarious reasons than the illicit deals which were furthering Cherix's business ambitions. Outwardly respectable, but even before the war entwined with the German intelligence in Bern and Zurich, Cherix was soon thriving. The numerous cabarets and similar places of entertainment for his kingdom, business was booming, Young women of well, relatively dubious morality were drawn like magnets to the Quartier des Paquis with its mixture of luxurious hotels and maison clos or brothels. Marie Antoinette was soon Cherix's official mistress. Thriving in this new opulent life as a chanteuse lyrique in the bustling music halls of Geneva, the stage name became. Regina Diana, and it suited her perfectly. Regina, Latin for queen, and Diana, 
the Greek goddess of hunting gives a clear insight into her ambitions. Now a linchpin in Sharik's empire, his German contacts were increasingly on the lookout for Francophone agents with anti-French tendencies began to take notice of her. Intelligence gathering was not a phenomenon born fully fledged at the outbreaks of hostility. Perhaps unbeknownst to the Swiss authorities, Zurich was becoming a nest of spies and Cherix, with his visceral hatred of France, was a key contact. He had been summoned to Bern in 1910 and he took a Regina with him on what was to, unbeknownst to her to become an interview that would seal her fate and that of thousands of men across Europe and indeed Britain's dominions. Impressed by her quick wits and her flamboyant books, the Germans decided to trial her. Her experience as a milliner would prove invaluable and the German authorities placed her in a Paris hat shop whose customers included the French army. By 1914, she had built up a wide clientele, including, crucially, a French general. <coughs> this establishment was in fact within sight of the very same Chateau de Vincennes, where a century later, David and I began our quest to find her. So, why was Germany so keen to recruit Regina? If not a Swiss citizen, she was a Geneva resident. And by the turn of the 20th century, Switzerland's neutral status was well established in international law. We covered that in our 45 history, minute, history lesson about Switzerland in World War I. But if the truth be told, this tiny country situated at the heart of Western Europe was far more multifaceted and at times far more conflicted than it outwardly appeared. With its then 25 cantons or counties, with its citizens speaking three major European languages, and even then calling itself home to hundreds of thousands of immigrants, those countries who would become the main belligerents were establishing spy networks and recruiters years before the greatly anticipated pan-European war broke out. Despite post-war claims to the country, Germany had laid out its stall in Switzerland well before 1914, with some agents, including Diana, being trialed in the field. So, how exactly did this come about? In 1909, a Prussian officer with a name to be revered or feared presented his credentials as military attaché at the German embassy in Bern. He was Busso von Bismarck, a scion of the great Bismarck family. He rapidly proved his worth through an intelligence sharing deal with Friedrich von Wattenwiel, chief of Swiss military intelligence. Extensive exchanges of high level information concerning Great Britain, France and Russia soon followed. Indeed, the Bern embassy was considered so crucial to German espionage operations that by 1918, Bismarck had 80 people working for him, the largest staff of any belligerent power in Switzerland. The fact that by operating spy rings via their embassies, they were breaking the diplomatic code and consequently imperiling their host country's neutral status mattered not one jot to any of the miscreants, which included France, Russia and Great Britain, although it must be admitted that Great Britain's operation was totally shambolic and seems to have consisted of climbing mountains to check wind direction and speed. German military attaché Busso von Bismarck's cause was undoubtedly assisted by one of the highest ranking officers in the Swiss army, Ulrich Wille, who was a confirmed Germanophile and he had striven to remodel the Swiss citizen army along Prussian lines. He was married to Otto von Bismarck's daughter, Clara. Like most of the higher echelons of the Swiss army at the time, Ulrich had spent time in Prussia and his crowning achievement was responsibility for the 1912 joint 
German-Swiss military maneuvers. Attended by the German emperor and even dubbed the Kaiser's maneuvers, parts of the Swiss press were ecstatic and others acerbic in their reporting of the events. It's worth pointing out that attitudes both then and during the war were not divided exclusively along linguistic lines. It didn't automatically follow that the German speaking Swiss were pro-Germany and French speaking Swiss were pro-France, although there was a, a substantial minority of each group of the population who favored the belligerent of their native tongue. However, a Swiss German friend recently told me that her grandmother was so outraged that her small son had to line the route with other classmates during these maneuvers and wave intertwined German and Swiss flags as the Kaiser's train went by. And as they live close to the field of operations, despite the official prohibition on pegging out her washing on the day of the Kaiser's visit, she ple pegged her bloomers in a prominent position. Perhaps this is a stage at which I will deviate very briefly although I am staying within the spy topic. And I'd like to tell you a washing story relating to the American War of Independence. Indeed, this ties in very neatly with my theme of Regina because the Great War was far from the first in which women acted as spies and spy networks had sprung up long before the Great War and these run by women and they provided critical intelligence. Some women, successfully infiltrated enemy lines, often acted as peddlers selling useful items to the soldiers. And during the American War of Independence, they kept their eyes peeled and their eyes and ears close to the ground to gain information about troops, artillery and provisions. Information that all spies, including Regina, would in their turn be asked to provide a century later. And this, of course, was irrespective of whose side they were spying. Spies frequently operate in rings. And during the American War of Independence, the most elaborate spy network centered around New York. Intelligence was passed through many, often female hands. On the surface, there might have been little to make anyone think about a Mrs. Anna Strong. Her nine children would surely have kept her busy with domestic chores. Outward appearances can be deceptive. And along with washing, shopping and cooking, she was sending coded messages and signals to other agents in an anti-British spy ring. Despite the British becoming suspicious and even at one point occupying Anna's property, they were unable to see what or whom was staring them in the, play, in the face. She was simply using her washing line to conceal messages. A black petticoat would announce an arrival or departure and handkerchiefs pegged in certain order, revealed at which of six locations a boat was moored, a boat which could be used to deliver information to George Washington's headquarters. The undervaluing of women's abilities and worth not to mention the domestic nature of Anna's coded intelligence enabled her ring to flourish. The contemporary male military minds could not, at the end of the 18th century, envision a woman being deeply involved in espionage. The officers who were billeted on Anna were simply outwitted by a black petticoat and colored hankies fluttering in the breeze. Today, one New York chapter of the Daughters of the American Revolution are known as the Anna Strong chapter. Their insignia are petticoat and handkerchiefs commemorating her washing line. So anyway, let's get back to Switzerland, to Regina and the First World War. <coughs> Less than two years after these 1912 maneuvers, which so divided Switzerland and outraged my friend's grandmother, Germany invaded Belgium. On August the 1st, 1914, Swiss National Day, Ulrich Wille was appointed commander in chief of the Swiss army. It was rumored that this appointment had been imposed on the Swiss government by the Kaiser himself 
in return for a guarantee of Swiss neutrality. We certainly didn't cover that in our history lesson. Well, some saw this appointment as an excellent example of Swiss pragmatism and as a way of securing the Confederation's borders. Others felt that it showed that neutral Switzerland was expecting a German victory. Surely, if Switzerland was, at, leading, at least according to much of the press and far from exclusively the Germanophone press, leaning towards Germany, Many citizens must have felt that helping Germany win the war could only be a good thing. This made them easy prey for German recruiters. To many thousands of other Swiss, neutrality was the very cornerstone on which Switzerland depended. Showing any alliance with Germany was a betrayal of all that Switzerland stood for, and they were equally quick to show their outrage. And this is a theme that runs through many, many newspapers between really September 1914 and to the outbreak of, of war, that the fear that Switzerland was losing, sacrificing its neutrality. And in fact, in 1916, a little mourning card was issued as a, a postcard claiming that Madame Helvetia and her children, the Swiss cantons, they're all named there, all the Swiss cantons, announced the death in Zurich of their beloved child and, and sibling, Mademoiselle Neutralité Helvetia. It was a real fear that if Switzerland lost its neutral status, then the repercussions would be absolutely horrendous. Regina, however, harbored no such concerns about Swiss neutrality, and she was eager to start her mission of spying for Germany. But of course, once recruited, a spy needs training and handling. And I'd now like you to meet one of the most skilled sky, spy masters of all times, only she was a spy mistress, Dr. Elisabeth Schragmuller. Was, even by today's standards, a truly exceptional woman, even more so by those of a century ago. Her story begins at the turn of the 20th century, when despite her father and indeed the widespread German prohibition on women entering higher education, she forced the Albert Ludwig Universität in Fribourg in Brisgau, just across the Swiss border, to enroll her as a student in 1908. An able linguist, she spent some time in 1910 in Lausanne perfecting her French and almost certainly making contact with the German embassy in Bern. She proved so brilliant that not only did she earn the highest bachelor's degree of her year, in 1913, she became the first German woman to earn a doctorate in political family. Rather than being proud, her wealthy parents considered Elizabeth's outstanding brain an inconvenience in a female child. Then, to her family horror, she found a job as a social worker, which brought her into contact with what she termed the broad strain of the population and with the working class. This increased her knowledge and understanding of human psychology, skills she would soon be able to put to excellent use in the service of her beloved fatherland. When war broke out, Elizabeth was furious that as a woman, she could not serve in the German army, but she was determined to do her bit. And having laid siege to their offices for several days, on the 20th of August, 1914, she succeeded in browbeating the authorities in Berlin into issuing her with a pass, which enabled her to make her way to German occupied Brussels. When she left Cologne, in August 1914, her sister, who was performing a suitably feminine role as a nurse, reminded her to do nothing that might bring the family's reputation into ill repute. When she arrived in Brussels, Elizabeth took a room in the luxurious Hotel Astoria, which Germany had commandeered for high-ranking officers she daily waylaid the no notoriously vicious, newly appointed governor of Brussels, Field Marshal von der Goltz, demanding a job. Finally, he capitulated, 
and shunted her off to a backwater, a military office handling mail confiscated from German soldiers, from, sorry, from Belgian soldiers. Here, her ability to pick out every vital nugget of information, place this in the bigger picture and provide military commanders with an accurate view of troop morale and movements made the head of the German intelligence bureau, one Walter Nikolai, sit up and take note. Nikolai had extensive contacts in Switzerland. And the intelligence that Elizabeth gathered from the in letters that she was reading probably hastened Antwerp's fall to the Germans in October 1914. Nikolai was even more interested in her now, and he decided to train her in military intelligence and swiftly promoted her. She was to head up the entire anti-French intelligence bureau. She, a woman, was placed in charge of the recruitment and training of agents, as well as debriefing them after their missions across all of the Western theater. This obviously was a huge job. Although initially, like many of her contemporaries, Elizabeth had seen spying as something corrupt, which only those of questionable morality and dubious loyalty would undertake. Exposure to the real world of intelligence gathering led her, as it would countless others, to see that to be successful, both recruiter and spy have to form part of a highly structured, well-organized whole. She began to see espionage as a science which could be taught and learnt, not some sort of adventure to be undertaken for cheap thrills and a quick buff. Quick buck. Her brief career in social work made her aware that a good spy can be found in unlikely places, and she certainly found some in very unlikely places. She established a series of spy schools, one close to where Switzerland and Germany meet. The extensive curriculum included meticulous training on recognizing uniforms, ranks, and regimental badges, the bane of many spies on both sides' lives. <coughs> Several spies' memoirs talk of burning the mid midnight oil, memorizing the tiny differences between shoulder titles, cap badges, and badges of rank. We know from gathered evidence about Regina that she herself made only one mistake when reporting back on the British regiments she had observed massing in Marseille. Thousands of British and Commonwealth troops, of course, passed through this major port. But spies need to do more than memorize uniform details. They learned to manufacture and write in invisible ink on tissue paper, which could be swallowed if needs be, on rice paper, which does not make a noise when it is unfolded, and they learned to engrave minute letters on spectacle frames and place these over the lenses and to hide messages in shoe heels, umbrella handles and matchboxes, as well as in hems of skirts. Stamps were an innocent looking but key component in a spy's kit. Either the spy wrote on the envelope before affixing the stamp, miniature writing came in handy here, or meticulously cut the perforations to conceal a message. We will, of course, never know exactly what messages were hidden by the stamps on the seemingly innocent letters Regina exchanged with her mother in Geneva, but we can be sure that the recipients knew and acted on the intelligence. Looking through some of the documents associated with Regina, it is obvious that she had learned her trade well. With the manufacture and sale of invisible ink banned, she simply made her own. She would also interpret messages hidden in both the stems and indeed the arrangements of the flowers in the bouquets handed up to her after her cafe concert performances. Undoubtedly, not coincidentally, another of Elizabeth's successful agents was an illiterate florist in Marseille, where Regina had been based since 1915 and which was cr a crucial entry and exit point for allied troops. And to help Regina pass information and back to Zurich and onwards to Germany, a plethora of postcards was actually on sale 
detailing which troops were arriving, which in terms of security and potential spies seems pretty lax on the part of the French. It seems absolutely extraordinary that they censored letters so very, very carefully, but yet you could buy a postcard that would say Russian troops arriving in Marseille on the 26th of April, 1915. And so we've, there are a number of postcards in Regina's files that show the, this type of information, which was easy to send back to, um, to her mother in Geneva. Unsurprisingly, if we go back to Schragmula, she had a ruthless streak and a pitiless approach to sacrificing a lesser spy to protect a more valuable one. She knew that a spy who has been apprehended or compromised is damaged goods, and she immediately distanced herself and any uncompromised members of the ring from them. There are few people for whom Deutschland über alles could have rung more true. Her one aim throughout the war was to live to see a victorious fatherland and do all that she could to deliver that victory. Nothing or no one else mattered. If things turned sour for one of her spies, did they realize or did Rosina herself realize that no one, neither the Swiss authorities, because she was not Swiss, but held an Italian passport, nor Schragmuller, to whom all spies were finally expendable, did she realize that no one would attempt to save her. As wartime Marseille forms the backdrop to Regina's story from 1915, I think it's time that we head to what was both a key port and a hotbed of spies. But crucially, as well as being full of spies, Marseille, France's premier port in terms of shipping and commerce, had long had a deeply seedy reputation because as well as being France's premier port in terms of shipping, it was also France's premier port in terms of the sex trade. No doubt to Schragmuller's delight, things would only get worse. To the outrage of many of Marseille's citizens, sex workers openly propositioned soldiers and sailors in bars, parks, theatres, and places of public entertainment, including music halls, and also in the labyrinth of roads near the old port. Thousands of conscripts willingly parted with a few sous to help them forget what they had just been through or what might be to come. In the music halls and cafe concert for which the port was almost famous and to which troops and those on leave flocked, numerous artistes were on the game, relatively, Discreet prostitutes, such as Regina, well, that's what the police call her in her file. I'm not sure how you can be a discreet prostitute, but apparently you can be, and she was. And she easily could slip below the radar of the not so very vigilant so-called morality police. By mid-1915, Agent Regina Diana was totally established in Marseille, but not thanks to Schragmuller's pay packets in the red light district depicted in the card, but in the classy Place de la Bourse area. A farm market, whoops, sorry, a far more upmarket place in which to entertain her clients. Well remunerated by Schragmuller, who believed in paying well and on time for information, Regina had painstakingly her empire. She traveled countless times between Geneva and Marseille, ensuring she was a well-known passenger with all her papers correctly stamped. And she was lodging semi-permanently in the Grand Hôtel des Princes, which was, was in one of Marseille's classiest areas. If you plan to indulge in pillow talk with high-ranking officers, then a CD rooming house in the old port is surely not conducive to the sharing of classified information. Regina knew how to keep her clients happy and they were eager to return for more of her pleasures. But she had been recruited because she was a chanteuse lyrique or musical artist, and this would remain her cover. In this harsh backstage, in this harsh world, 
backstage, cafe concerts and music halls, despite their exotic sounding names such as Alcazar and Alhambra, were hardly more than dives. For the women who worked in them, life was precarious and harsh. The changing rooms where artists stored the outfits they had to provide for themselves were filthy. Tobacco fumes from hundreds of smokers almost asphyxiated the singers as they sang, and the gas jets of the performance areas were turned high enough to, as one artist put it, roast them. Proprietors took a large cut from any proffered tips. Contracts were exploitative, with singers expected to be constantly available, and not only for performances and rehearsals. A repertoire of dozens of patriotic songs was required, and any one of these could be pulled by the censor at the very last minute. The programme changed fortly, fortnightly, and the artiste had to be able to lead the audience in patriotic singing, as well as belt out her own solo songs in a voice loud enough to drown out the more raucous spectators. Regina's signature song was composed for her, Salut aux Alliés, or Hail to the Allies. Allies. Only she and her ring knew which allies she was, in fact, saluting. One empathetic observer of a concert artist noticed how, perspiring, panting, her fat body heaving with feigned excitement, her arms red with the heat, the singer looked like some great lobster. Never for the life of me have I been able to recall her name, but I shall not easily forget the infinite sadness that descended on my soul at the sight of her. Should we really blame Regina for accepting the escape route that first Cherix and then Schragmüller seemed to offer? If she played her cards right, kept up her steady flow of accurate, this of course was vital, accurate information, she could leave this exploitative world behind her, and she was soon at the height of her powers. Having been established in Marseille for 18 months, her network would soon extend from Paris to Algiers, obviously to Marseille and onward to Geneva. Her informants from across the social and military spectra were providing information covering strategic troop movements as well as what was happening on the dock side. Amongst the intelligence she gleaned, both from her own observations and pillow talk, there was talk of a forthcoming key French offensive. In order to transmit information about this offensive, Regina was using various codes written in invisible ink on postcards sent to multiple addresses in Zurich and from there to Berlin. Obviously, if you're living in Marseille during the war, you can't send a card to Berlin. So all of her post, all of her information was transmitted via Switzerland. Her mother in Geneva was a key um, point of contact and she would either forward the information on to Bern and, or, and from there it would go to Berlin or sometimes agents would actually call on the on her in her flat in, in Geneva to collect the information if it was seen as being particularly important. One series of cards that Regina sent told of huge numbers of troops massing in Marseille, awaiting to be sent to a ridge in northern France, where the authorities were planning what would turn into an engagement with calamitous consequences for the French. Most spies would agree that however many precautions they take, however brilliant their training and indeed their own skills, Lady Luck has a part to play. And Lady Luck was about to make her appearance in Regina's life in the form of a wood burning stove. On a fateful night, one of Regina's postcards was covering the 417 kilometers from Marseille to Lyon on the night mail train. It was, a, it was cold in the middle of February and the post wagon was heated by a large wood burning stone where vigilant post workers 
were sporting post ready for the train's arrival. The temperature was near tropical, so much so that something strange began to happen to one card. Phoenix-like, a second message began to appear. The seemingly innocent looking postcard was very far from being what it seemed to be. In Lyon, the card was handed to the local gendarme and rushed to the military authorities in Paris. They passed it on to a graphologist who specialized in disguised handwriting. To the authorities' horror, this card was relaying heavily censored intelligence on this occasion about significant civilian unrest as well as crippling strikes in Marseille. On no account must the enemy hear about how low French morale was. Wars are not won on the battlefield alone. Now, the spy was being spied upon. In a one week period, four postcards destined for Zurich were traced back to Marseille. These reported not only on the all important civilian morale, but gave precise insider information about ships anchored off Marseille, and also that over 4,000 British and Canadian, as well as French troops were mustering, ready to depart for northeastern France. They were destined for the Chemin de Dam. Aware her intelligence was crucial, Regina sent it multiple times. While some postcards were intercepted, others got through. Arrested on the 16th of March, 1917, mountains of evidence were meticulously amassed and presented at her trial, which opened on the 17th of September, 1918. Although Regina never cracked under interrogation, when a friendly, sympathetic co-prisoner arrived in her cell, she confided that she loathed France and everything she stood for. Little did Regina know that like so many spies before and since, she had fallen victim to the plant technique. Amongst the 470 damning items were the names of troop ships, some of which had been sunk with considerable loss of life over the precise period she had been active in Marseille. And she started to tell this, this plant about the ships that she had seen. The names were carefully memorized and then passed over to the authorities. One such incident, which occurred in early May, 1917, may well have been prepared by Regina's ring because although she had been arrested, there is no, nothing that indicates that the whole ring had been broken up. Documents held in her file indicate the ships she was informing on, including the Transylvania. On the 3rd of 1917, Transylvania left Marseille bound for Alexandra. Amongst the 3,400 souls aboard, was Territorial Forces nursing sister, Jessie Hayward from Norfolk. At 4 a.m. on the 3rd of May, Jessie had been to Transylvania. She waxed lyrical about the ship, lovely, beautiful births, births. Sadly, she had but one night in which to enjoy her eiderdown, which looks so nice. Once aboard, a lifeboat drill led by matron and considered a bit of a farce was held for the sisters. This was to familiarize the nurses with the actions to take should their vessel be torpedoed. Life belts would be worn at all times. Seeing, themselves sunning, seeing them sunning themselves on the deck in the early hours of the next morning, Matron took her nursing personnel to task for failing to wear their life belts. Within 15 minutes of this ticking off, as Jessie called it, there was a bang, which those who heard it will never forget. Surprisingly, Jessie wrote, there was no panic. Everyone went to her a lot of place. Jessie's lifeboat, containing 45 of us all pushed in, is lowered. I really think this was the worst moment. The cheers of the men still on board, many of whom would have known from personal experience the inestimable value of professional nurses, the women were launched into a sea described as rough. However, initially, the shore did not seem too far away. Then, to Jessie's horror, 
she sees a second torpedo strike. She writes, another bang and Transvania is no more. The sea seems alive, men clinging to oars, rafts and boats. They look sadly at our boat, but we are sinking. I and all the sisters think we shall sink with the boat. I wonder what they will think at home. With waves now increasing in size, I am washed out and find myself clinging to an oar and a piece of rope. Clinging literally for dear life to her oar and with her arms aching beyond description, with waves crashing over her head and nauseous from all the seawater she was swallowing. She heard a voice saying that the Japanese destroyer which had convoyed the ship was alongside. Still retaining something of her sense of humour, she thought, my head was going to be knocked and it was a pity to be killed after all the holding on. Nevertheless, she was taken on board. Brandy, wine glugged out of a bottle and a towel for warmth helped her to revise and bask in the relief of survival and feel immeasurable gratitude towards the Transylvanian Japanese rescuers. The incident was recounted in the um, British press on June the 10th, 1917. But often the fact that nurses had been on board sinking ships would be covered up because this would, it was felt would be bad for morale of the civilian population. So although the Japanese destroyer had rescued the nurses, no mention is actually made of that in the newspaper article. The survivors from these ships were taken ashore at Savona. Jessie writes, what a reception we had, the cheers. We felt quite heroines and had done nothing to deserve it. We must have looked weird, some wrapped in blankets, others in men's coats and all with wet draggled hair. Having attended the funeral service held on the 6th of May for Transylvania's dead and missing, the sisters were ordered to return to England to procure new kit. When they were finally aboard their blighty bound transport, Jessie noted, none of us slept very well and we clung to our life belts, although the steward said they were not necessary. With true British understatement, she comments that, should I ever get out to the east, I hope it won't be so exciting as this first attempt. A footnote to her story is that she finally arrived in Salonika on September the 9th, 1917, having once again departed from Marseille. One can only imagine the fear that she must have felt as she boarded her transport on this second occasion. Such losses, which occurred at the same time as documents proving that Regina had been passing information about Allied shipping, would have done much to strengthen the, the views of those who were so busy amassing evidence against her. Indeed, so sensitive was this information seen to be that when the trial actually opened, the court sat in camera. Some 450 incriminating documents were presented to the court. On the 20th of September, 1917, to the surprise of no one, the president of the court pronounced the guilty verdict. In accordance with Article 81 of the Military Code, Sylvain Marie-Antoinette Avico, alias Regina Diana, was to be executed by firing squad. But the process of law was not yet complete. Justice still both had to be done and to be seen to be done. It was for the Court of Appeal in Paris to reach a final decision. Should clemency be extended? Or was the case solid and thus the relevant article of the military code could be enforced? The court's verdict dated the 22nd of November 1917 was unambiguous. The prosecution had proved its case Raymond Poincaré, President of the French Republic, had decided justice should take its course and the dread sentence be carried out. As the firing party mustered at Marseille's Champ de Tire Fajo at 6.30 in the morning of Saturday, the 5th of January, 1918, the crowds also gathered. If the trial had been held behind closed doors, 
not so the execution. Did the expectant spectators wonder why the firing party consisted not of the usual 12, but of 25 men, each with a loaded rifle? Nothing the French authorities had decided must prevent 32-year-old Regina Diana paying the ultimate price for her crime. Of the 25 shots fired, 12 impacted on the body, three on the heart. A nameless, unidentifiable common burial pit award awaited the mortal remains of this highly colourful, loud and deeply enigmatic woman. Was Marie-Antoinette Avicou, alias Regina Diana, a helpless pawn caught up in a game that was too intricate and too complicated, whose rules she did not fully comprehend? Or was she, like spy mistress Elizabeth Schragmuller, glorying in her power? But unlike the highly educated Schragmuller born to wealth and privilege, Regina had clawed her way up from her lowly background. Like all agents, she knew the stakes were high, but spying seemed to give her the opportunity to move away from the degrading life of a chanteur's lyrique at the beck and call of pimping managers and allow her to live a life which would have been unimaginable before the fateful events in distant Sarajevo on June the 28th, 1914. Why, you might now be wondering, did David and I go to such lengths to uncover and tell the story of Regina Diana? It is a question we have often asked ourselves. Even though she spied for the other side, we still feel she deserves a place in the pantheon of female intelligence agents of both world wars, some of whose names are deservedly for some, undeservedly perhaps for others, almost household ones. Regina Diana used her talents aptly, cultivating her skills as a milliner and using her powerful singing voice, she lured men to her bed. She provided her German spy masters with information which, while not leading to victory, helped to delay defeat and certainly contributed to France's catastrophic defeat on the Chemin des Dames a century after her lonely death. She has emerged from the shadows into which the French authorities seemed to try so hard to thrust her, and perhaps were even continuing to do so when we began our investigations at Vincennes in February, 2014. For us, she started as a barely glimpsed figure, one that we could not quite dismiss, constantly dancing on the periphery of our vision. She walked with us for months, a constant little voice at the back of our heads, telling us to keep persevering, for the story of her life and her lonely death were worth telling. So Winston Churchill acknowledged that writing a book is an adventure. To begin with, it is a toy and and an amusement. Then it becomes a mistress. Then it becomes a master. Finally, it becomes a tyrant. Nothing could more aptly sum up my nephew David and my, and indeed our long suffering respectist family's journey in the company of Regina Diana. Initially, we felt little more than idle curiosity about her. Slowly, this curiosity turned into both amusement and bemusement, then into an addiction, until the addiction became an obsession, an obsession to which all who know us will attest. If she is satisfied with our attempts to recreate both her life and the historical background against which she is best understood, may she, in her unknown and lost grave, somewhere in Marseille, finally rest at peace. 
And if you now feel you will be unable to sleep peacefully without finding more out more about not so neutral Switzerland, the German intelligence service and the woman whom the war illustrated referred to not quite accurately as Regina Diane, a Swiss singer who was condemned to death in France on being found guilty as a German spy. You too can read all about it in Regina Diana, seductress, singer, spy. Thank you very much. Beth, thanks very much indeed. That was tremendous. Thoroughly enjoyed that excellent presentation. Um, very unusual and uh, fascinating in, in equal measure. So thanks for them very much. In the yeah. usual manner, everybody, if we'd just like to uh, give a round of applause by using the uh, the hands up button that you'll see at the foot of your, your screen. Let's so let's do that and uh, Viva can confirm, although you can't see it, that there's a resounding round of applause going on, albeit silently, <laughs> with, with hundreds of hands uh, being raised on, on the Zoom software. So thanks very much for that. It's, Thank you. Um, it's question and answer time now. So uh, um, Sarah, um, I know that uh, you're uh, joining Hello. us. There we are. Hi, Sarah. Hi. Sorry, I'm trying to get my computer sorted. Of course, it never works in time. Thank you for an absolutely fascinating um, talk. That was amazing. Um, you talked about them, uh, Elizabeth especially, being in Belgium. Now, obviously, um, both ladies had French. Did Elizabeth especially learn uh, Flemish when she was there? Because obviously that would have been quite useful. Or did was it just with the... French people that she dealt with? I know that she was, the, the letters that she was um, reading were from the um, French-speaking Bel Belgian soldiers, but my gut feel is that she was such an accomplished linguist. I mean, she was such a brilliant woman that I would be very surprised if she did not very quickly acquire a working knowledge of, um, of Flemish. And she was certainly, she was completely trilingual in English, French and, and German. And she seemed to be the sort of person who could be in a in a country just for a matter of months and she would pick up the language with very, very little effort. So although I can't say yes, definitely, I would be very surprised if she didn't have at least a working knowledge of Are there of books Flemish. about her as well? Have you have you <clears throat> written and I've got several of your others. Have you got anything on on her no, well. um, she's she is very elusive. There have been there were a couple of French books that were written about her, but um, basically they are purple pro prose and little more than than that. Um, there was a lot of documents about her were actually found, and it's a strange story. Were actually found in Russia because Nikolai, um, who initially recruited her reappears in the Second World War. And when things are going very, very badly for, for Germany towards the end of the, the war, he moves further and further into East Germany, thinking that he will be safer there, um, which was a significant miscalculation <laughs> because invent eventually he was actually um, arrested uh, by, the, um, by the Russians, taken back to Moscow um, where he ended his days and all his papers were taken with him and they were filed away in Moscow where they remained unlooked at and unopened or certainly not available to the West till Glasnost, at which point um, some German historians then descended on the, the Nikolai papers and that was when the information about Schragmüller had come to light because he had kept a significant number of documents, obviously relating to, to her. And whereas the French had sort of created this rather mythical person, then um, German historians began to try and set the record straight about, about Schragmüller herself. So that's where the accurate information um, could be found. But unfortunately, his papers are no longer really ready, ready readily available to Western historians. Mm. So we had a brief interlude where he came to light and he died in, in Russia in, in prison and um, papers are still there. Thank you. Deeply Very frustrating. <laughs> Thank you for your information. 
Thanks for that, Sarah. Thanks for your question. Right. Okay. Uh, Gordon, waiting patiently there. Do you want to just unmute yourself? Yes. Thank you, David. Uh, wonderful, that. We've thoroughly enjoyed it. Uh, there's a film in that, isn't there? Oh, there is. Definitely. There is. Yes. There, 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 there's been a been a play, and there is a tiny bit of interest in in her, but whether or not that will translate into into a film, who knows? Who knows? It would have been. Um, yes, excellent film. Um, my question is, what happened to her mother and or her extended family <coughs> and her lover? Right. Um, mother appears in France in 1920 when there is, and it's, it's really rather sad, um, there's a lot of correspondence between mother and daughter when um, Marie-Antoinette or Regina is, is in prison, with them both trying to sort of keep each other's um, morale well, well boosted. And so there, there's a sort of constant flow of letters. A lot of letters reached um, Regina from the mother, although they were fairly well censored by the prison authorities. And a few actually left Regina, and they actually allowed her to correspond with her mother a few, a few times. And then after she's been executed, the mother gets in touch with the prison authorities, um, begging for her daughter's um, personal effects to be returned to her, and uh, which was forbidden during the during the war. And then in 19, I think the letter dated early 1920 there was a letter telling her that she can come to Marseille and collect the, her effects. So she goes, goes to Marseille to collect um, um, personal items of, of clothing and um, odd bits and pieces. And when she arrives, she's actually told that they've actually all been destroyed. So now whether or not this was willful and just sort of, you know, really wanting to punish the mother for the behavior of the daughter or whether it was a genuine mistake who who knows um, but the mother goes back to Geneva and then she completely sort of disappears off the off the scene that's the last sight that one one gets of her the father has disappeared long long before um, long before the war but um, Regina actually had had a daughter and I found the sort of correspondence the between the grandmother and the and the daughter, really quite quite heartbreaking, with the mother sort of writing to the to the granddaughter, and this sort of shows you the human side of what's going on, and the the grandmother writing and saying, oh, I'm sure that Mama will be will be all right, everything's fine, don't worry, and then there's a letter from the headmistress of the school where the daughter's at to the mother, sort of explaining what's going on with this this child, and how she's coping and how they're trying to protect her from knowledge of what was actually what had actually happened it's obvious from the story that the mother was deeply complicit in the spying why she was. wasn't she acted against why didn't they arrest her charge her well they they couldn't lay hands on her in switzerland no and no, when she france. when she comes to france in 1920 um the war is over Mm -hmm. So um, they actually, I think, would have probably decided that it was best to leave that one that one alone, because by this point, the mother had got Swiss nationality. Right. Um, okay. And in fact, ironically, Regina, had the war started three months later, Regina would have had Swiss nationality and her story might have been very different because Swiss did move to try to protect their citizens, particularly yeah, female just ones. She may just well have disappeared on that. She might just have dis disappeared or been exchanged in, in that case or sent back to Switzerland to serve a prison sentence. But because she, was, she wasn't Swiss, the Swiss would have nothing to do with her. Right. OK, thank you very much for that. That's You're welcome. deeply interesting. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Bye. Thanks, Gordon. Thanks a lot. Right. So um, we've got a couple of questions from folk who can't join us um, audio visually. So um, what we've got is a, a question from Maxine Hart. Uh, do you have any details of what uh, Dr. Elizabeth uh, Schrangmuller studied at university while she studying languages? No, she was she got a PhD in political economy. 
Um, so languages were just sort of something she just happened to be to be interested in. She just was one of these people who could pretty well do anything she turned her mind to. And she had actually considered or wanted to study medicine, which of course, had she studied medicine, she would have then ended up um, eventually probably as a doctor with the, um, at least for the German army at, in Germany. But um, women couldn't study medicine in Germany at that stage. So she then decided to do political economy, but she did spend about a year in Lausanne perfecting her French along the, along the way. So, um, and then she became the social worker. So she was, she was certainly a very, very versatile, brilliant woman. Great. Th th thanks, thanks for that. A uh, quick question just popped up also, uh, and we'll, we'll come to Eddie in a moment, but just very quick questions uh, popped up from Elizabeth Ann Adamson. What happened to the daughter? Do not know is the quick answer to that, because, of course, once the, once the court case closed, um, the, and any more information about her, because the, the letters between the school and the mother actually ended up in her, um, with her, on her, in her records, the French, that the French have. I have the daughter's name. I tried to trace her um, by her ancestry, but drew a complete, complete blank. French ancestry is not nearly as good, to be honest, as British ancestry. And David and I took the decision that we would not name her in the in the book because we felt that that was inappropriate um because they could well be descendants and oh, it wasn't for us to tell them that story if they know it that's a different matter but it wasn't for us to sure. um put the name out thanks for that right okay eddie you've been waiting patiently there if you want to fire in your question uh thank you very much for, for a, an excellent talk very very interesting indeed i've actually got sort of Two questions. First one was why was Maria so anti-French or anti-ally? The the question to that is that we have a very strong feeling, David and I, that it dates from her experiences in Collange when she was sent there as a 16-year-old, um, which was 15 when she arrived, 16 when she came back. She came back pregnant. So I think that they're Therein lies the answer. Um, Cherix, who was also very, very anti-French, um, that was because his father and their, their first garage business had actually been bankrupted by some very shady dealings by some French garagistes. Um, and I think that the two of them fueled each other's hatred. The sort of second question was just, what happened to your spy master, Elizabeth? Did Elizabeth, <coughs> right, after the, the war, she goes back to um, the Albert Ludwig Universität in Brisgau. And because she's a woman, she can't get a full professorship or um, job. So she works under a, a male professor who, um, from what we've managed to sort of work out and, and read, basically pinched quite a lot of her ideas and published good bit of plagiarism was going on. Uh, she complains to the university authorities, but is basically told to shut up and put up. In um, When the Second War broke out, her one of her brothers was very, very heavily involved with the Nazis, which she does not appear to have been. Um, but there is there are indications that they tried to recruit, the Nazis tried to recruit her again to go back into um, sort of handling agents in 1940, 1941. And she prevaricated and she actually died of TB in um, 1942. So although the brother was definitely a, a member of the, the Nazi party, we can't find information that she herself was. Thank you very much indeed. Thank, thanks for your question there. Thanks, Eddie. Right, um, we, we've just got another couple of questions. I, Ian um, Ferrens 
uh, who's uh, I, I know is in New York, so we, we, we've extended. <laughs> Send us bit. some snow, please. <laughs> uh, yeah, quite. So he, he Ian has, hasn't got to, is on an old computer without audio visual capabilities. So he's uh, he's typed the following question in. Um, first of all, once again, a wonderful talk. He says, "I'm wondering if, in your studies of women's roles in the Great War." you have devoted any time to the role of sex workers in the various combatant nations. There must have been quite a lot of them based on various trench diaries and memoirs released after the fact. Right, no, I haven't, I haven't sort of, interesting, interesting idea. I'm always on the lookout for other areas to, to, to go down and nothing that I've actually sort of studied in, in any great detail, but yes, I mean, there were huge numbers of, of sex sex workers across all the um, all the combatants inevit inevitably, and um, I mean we all, all know sort of ap apocryphal stories of uh, French French women and um, how they served the British British army, and undoubtedly that would have been the same right across the the various combatant nations, but not something I've ever sort of looked at in any any detail, but that would probably be worth looking at. Interesting idea. Thanks. And uh, Richard uh, hasn't got a video. Um, I, it's probably fairly unanswerable is this one, but nevertheless, Richard asks, uh, why were the British only interested in wind direction speed? <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea, but it's come up in three different sources. So I think that it it's probably not, was not, fairly three, three accurate three that it seemed to feel that they could in some way that this would be some interesting, useful information coming out of Switzerland. <laughs> Funny one, I have no idea. Good one, yeah. Uh, Leonard Maver has asked, um, again, he's got no um, capabilities on, on, on devices using. Uh, if uh, if she has a grave and if so, where is it located? No, no, no grave at all. Um, common burial pit. I have tried my utmost via Marseille um, to find out where exactly she is, but no doubt there's either a motorway, motorway built over her or a block of flats or or some such, um, she would just been tossed into some some burial pit. And nobody gave a damn basically about her. Sadly, sure. Uh, and um, you, you've given this. You, you said at the outset that you've given this presentation in French. I don't know if that's tough French <laughs> or, or, or or in Switzerland. But what do the French and Swiss make of the story? Um, usually, they're quite fascinated by her. Um, I think. Um, I suppose really it's, you know, it's a century ago now. It's just a very good story. Um, the Swiss are bemused, I think, that um, how, how she managed to sort of get away with it. And they're very, and because obviously it's French speaking Switzerland, which is leaning more, was leaning more towards France than than Germany, I think the French Swiss are, are quite sort of puzzled as to how somebody who'd been brought up in Geneva could be so anti-French and favour the, the Germans. Um, but they're generally just sort of interested in the, in the story itself for its own, own worth, if you like. Sure, yeah. But yeah. I find sometimes that the Swiss, the Swiss audience are pretty ignorant about their own First World War history and quite interested in finding out more about it because Switzerland was so very keen to address its role in the Second World War that the First World War got swept under the carpet and was only really in 2014 there began to be conferences held about Switzerland in, in the First World War and documents coming out that were used by historians then. Right, that's that. Thanks for that answer. I've just something's popped up. I was just about to wrap it up for the evening, uh, but we've just got one comment in, um, which I'm just going to read aloud here uh, from Patrick Hammer. Uh, just a comment from an artillery officer: prevailing wind direction and wind speed are essential factors when plotting long-range fire. Also, the balloon units were at the mercy of the wind, which influenced the, the use of observation balloons. This is just a guess, of course. So thanks, Patrick, for... for who, who knows? Maybe they were scrambling up mountains to good avail, but it seems as though in Bern it was quite a long way. But, you know, long range is long range. Perhaps they're having a nice holiday. Who knows? Yes. <laughs> 
look, it's um, we, we've, we've run out of questions, um, which um, is uh, a bit of a shame, but the, the questions that we have had were very interesting. Uh, so thanks for asking those. Um, thanks very much Viv, for your splendid presentation this evening. Um, it's obviously 20 past 10 in uh, in France where you are, so uh, well past bedtime. Uh -huh. What we'll do is, is is just ask for a final round of applause from everybody but via the, uh, the the hands up uh, routine again, and I can confirm that there's lots of hands going virtually up Thank virtually uh, as, as a round of applause. Um, again, I just uh, would re-advertise the fact that uh, we've uh, got a, a webinar every Monday in, in, the, in the rest of January. So if not registered yet, please do so. If you're watching us on Zoom, on, on Facebook, please do feel free to, to join us on, on Zoom where you can actually and interact slightly better um, that, than on Facebook. Um, but thanks very much for everybody who's watched and thanks Viv, for your splendid efforts tonight. Thank you very much indeed. Great to be with you. Thank you. Super okay good. then. Thanks Bye. very much. Good Bye. Night, everybody. Bye. Bye.